just just to be clear, he he is an religious free will colony district. To call upon you. Okay. Um, Begin the meeting, please, uh, at 3.30. Item number two, safety message, invocation, and pledge of allegiance. Ma'am, I need to um, confirm the quorum. Uh, Sorry about that. Go ahead. We have yourself, the vice chair, the mayor, trustee Steen. We have a quorum. All right. Thank you. Sorry about that. So excited to start the meeting. Item number two. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Chad Hubengarner. I'm Vice President of Financial Planning. Uh, I work with our, uh, our finance team in financial services with uh, Mr. Corey Kuczynski. We first wanted to uh, review the evacuation procedures so that we're prepared to be safe in the event of an emergency. If you hear the fire alarm, follow the instructions announced through the PA system. If asked to evacuate, use the glass doors exiting out of the boardroom to the outside. If that door is blocked, use the back door. Verbally alert others in the room and evacuate, then move to the main parking lot in the front of the building or the AT&T parking lot over the McCullough or Brooklyn bridges. In the event of a situation like this, our security team will be monitoring the situation and will notify the appropriate emergency services and team members. We also have employees nearby who are trained to administer first aid if needed. Safety is a top priority at CPS Energy, and while we hope this never is needed, we want to be sure we are always ready. Please join me in an invocation. We thank you for the many blessings you have freely given to each of us, and we ask your presence to guide this meeting of the CPS Energy Board of Trustees. Provide them with the knowledge, compassion, and wise counsel needed as they discuss the business matters on the agenda today. Help us all to remember that we are stewards acting on behalf of our customers and provide us with the grace to serve all people well. We ask this in your name, amen. Now join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. Item number three, public comment. Thank you. Public comment provides an opportunity for members of the public to share thoughts on posted agenda items for this meeting. We will invite pre-registered speakers to speak. They may only address the board on CPS Energy related business listed on the posted agenda. Speakers should state their first and last name, the organization or group they represent, and the agenda item they will speak about. For this meeting, we have five in-person speakers. Each speaker will have two minutes to speak. Thomas, will you please cue the timer? Our first speaker is Henrietta LaGrange, followed by Danny Zimmerman. Thank you for allowing me to be here. Two minutes is not enough time, but I did take a poll. Everywhere I went, I would ask people on the race, and a lot of them would say, we may not like it, but we understand. So. We don't like it, but we understand that it has to be done. The only thing is your second one, I think we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. But uh, first of all, I want to thank Mr. Garza, Rudy, because San Antonio has done a 360 since he's been the new CEO. People call me that they see the difference. If they call that a light or whatever needs to be addressed, he's addressing it. But first of all, let me take the women, the leadership. Janie Gonzalez, Francine Romero. I love seeing you there because it also gives me hope. I know that I've been a chairman too, and it is not easy being a chairman. So. Mr. Steen, also, thank you for being here. And I'm sorry Dr. Lackey is not here. And the mayor, also, thank you for being here. But let's not forget the people that stand behind us, and that's all the CPS workers, because they're the ones that keep us standing up straight and having pride in CPS energy. But also, I would like to address the mayor. 
I can't change the name of San Antonio, but he can do a proclamation and name one day Henrietta LaGrange Day. Thank you. Thank you for your input. Our next speaker is Danny Zimmerman, followed by Martin Gutierrez. Good afternoon, Mayor Nuremberg, Chairwoman Gonzalez, Vice Chair Dr. Romero, Trustees Dr. Mackey, looks like he's uh, unable to be here today. Mr. Steen, thank you for giving us the opportunity to come and weigh in on the CPS energy proposed rate increase. My name is Danny Zimmerman. I am uh, Executive Principal and CFO for Cleary Zimmerman Engineers. I'm also the Chairman of the North San Antonio Chamber of Commerce, and I'm here speaking on behalf of the North Chamber. Ahead of the Thanksgiving break, we sent each of you an early letter of support, and again today we want to strongly encourage you uh, to support the proposed rate increase of 4.25 percent. We remain committed to this position and ask for your support and approval. CPS Energy remains a foundational asset to our community's economic success. With the region's expected population surge of 30 percent by 2030, I know we're all feeling it on the roads. My wife complains regularly and I tell her not to because it fuels our lifestyle. The metro area is also projected to top 4 million by 2050 and the city's expanded expanding energy infrastructure and innovative solutions uh, needs must be ready to meet the increasing demands that will only keep growing over time because this area is just so popular. We believe the effects of population growth and economic development are important and worth the investment in the long view. Businesses need available and readily available power to succeed and to grow and for businesses to move here. We were here before you a year ago providing testimony, public testimony, supporting the now approved P2 blend power generation plan. As a recognized leader in renewable energy, it is critical to commit to financing and investing in CPS's continued operations that are focused on power generation, resiliency, technology, security, among other elements. As our letter stated, CPS remains, in our opinion, a good steward of our trust and with your leadership continues to fulfill its commitment to making progress and improvements while maintaining financial stability. The proposed rate increase is less than originally projected. See, my time is running out. As business leaders, we understand that short-term business and or long-term business and economic success is contingent upon making carefully vetted hard decisions. Uh, CPS Energy has done, their leadership has done a good job and we just want to encourage you again uh, to support this rate increase. Thank you for your commitment to um, Rudy Garza and his team and also to this board. Thank you for your input. Our next speaker is Martin Gutierrez followed by Jeff Webster. Good afternoon, Chairwoman Gonzalez, CPS Energy Board of Trustees. My name is Martin Gutierrez. I'm the Director of Government Relations for the San Antonio Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, who is comprised of 900 members, the majority of which are small locally owned businesses. On behalf of our more than 900 members, I'm here today to express our support for the CPS Energy proposed base rate increase of 4.25%. Reliable energy is essential for the continuity of business operations. We strongly believe the proposed rate increase balances the necessary investments CPS Energy must make to remain financially strong while maintaining some of the lowest rates in Texas. The necessary investments in security, infrastructure, resiliency, technology, security, and their people will help CPS Energy continue to provide affordable and reliable power for San Antonio residents and small businesses. While we are supportive of the rate increase, we are concerned about the impact on small businesses in San Antonio. Post-pandemic, small businesses continue to deal with record inflation, supply chain disruptions, and labor challenges. This rate increase will be another challenge they face, which will directly impact their bottom line and for some result in increased operational cost. We do believe that incremental increases to make the necessary investments is a balanced approach that is mindful of the small businesses in San Antonio. With these considerations, the Hispanic Chamber is pleased to support the CPS Energy proposed base rate increase, which will allow CPS Energy to invest in their operations that will benefit our community for generations to come. Thank you for the time. Thank you for your input. Our next speaker is Jeff Webster, followed by Katie Harvey.
Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I want to thank you all for the opportunity to be here today. My name is Jeff Webster. I am the two-day on-the-job president and CEO of the Greater San Antonio Chamber of Commerce. But I do have to say this subject is not new to me. We were, I was here a year ago. It was brought up. We talked about resources for CPS as the policy chair for the chamber to speak. But you know, you've heard some great comments from my friends at the Hispanic Chamber and the North Chamber, and I'm not going to reiterate it. I have a written statement that the chamber will be sending out to you, hitting on all those fine points that those gentlemen have supported. But I want to be clear. The Greater San Antonio Chamber stands in support of this rate increase. Do we look forward to a rate increase? No. What do we look forward to is surety, resiliency, economic growth, and a commitment to our community. I, as some of you know, have sat in some of your seats and had to make these kind of tough votes. And I know how hard it can be as a former council member when you vote on these kind of things. It's tough. And it's tough to hear people say, I'm going to struggle with a $5 bill increase. The value I know is I know what CPS in this city has done over the years to work with our community and help those in need to make sure the right things are done to protect the innocent and the poor. At the same time, the business community, we need to support growth and economic development because what pays those bills and that resiliency and that surety is jobs and economic growth. I cannot go out and visit with companies and speak on behalf of our community if we can't assure them we have power and resiliency. I remember my house on that cold winter day. I remember my house when we had rotating brownouts. But the commitment from this organization and our city to make sure and invest in the future of our city helps prevent those kind of things and will help grow our economic base. So, Rudy, I thank you and your staff for being diligent. Like always, I shared with you, we always look for the city and any of our utilities to do the best to reduce costs to hopefully mitigate some of those future increases. I know you're going to do that every day. We ask you continue to be diligent on expenses and costs. With that, no, the Chamber stands with you on this, this raise, and thank you very much for your time today. Appreciate you. Thank you for your input. Our last speaker is Katie Harvey. Board of Trustees, thank you for allowing me to speak today. My name is Katie Harvey. I'm CEO of KGB Texas Communications and this year's Chairman of the Greater San Antonio Chamber of Commerce. To reiterate what Jeff said, but keeping it very um, tight, the Greater San Antonio Chamber of Commerce supports CPS's proposed rate increase of 4.25%. We do support the reinvestment in the infrastructure of the utility for resiliency and reliability. The business community also supports CPS's investment in increasing its generational, generational capacity as our community continues to track of one of the fastest growing cities in the nation. Creating certainty around CPS's finances will also help to maintain the utility's strong credit rating, which results in more affordable energy for all of our community. We also support the rate increase in 2027, provided that it does not exceed 5.5%. Thank you for all the work that has gone into this and appreciate your leadership very much, Rudy. Thank you all. Thank you for your input. That was our last registered speaker. Thank you. Um, Shanna, if you could please, Mr. Dr. Mike is here, if you could acknowledge that. Yes, ma'am. As of 3.39 p.m., all trustees were present. Thank you very much. Item number four, which is Chair's remark. Um, I would like to just open with first wishing my mom a happy birthday. Today's her 72th birthday. I'm sure she's going to get upset that I mentioned 72. But happy birthday, mom, and thank you for all the great birthdays you gave me, and I'm hoping you have the best birthday today. On that note, um, again, good afternoon. Thank you, all of you who are present and those of you who are listening online. First, I'd like to thank all of you who have participated by sharing your voice and valuable feedback and different mechanisms, whether it was attending a meeting, whether it was a B session attendance, whether it was you participating in a committee, whether it was you speaking to us this past couple of months. Thank you for that valuable feedback and your voice. I also want to thank, again, our, let our community know that we have our customers at the forefront of all that we do as a board. It is our responsibility to guide this organization through the energy transformation while we remain focused on growing our customer needs. I look forward to the discussion today with my colleagues. On that note, if we can go ahead and proceed to the next item, which is item number six, 
a base increase in multi-year rate plan and regulation asset request for approval. And just a quick correction, this is agenda item five. Five, yes, five, sorry. So, Madam Chair, as uh, my team gets ready to get going, I've just got a few comments I want to make uh, to, to lead into the conversation. Uh, two years ago, uh, when I took over CPS Energy as, as, as a leader, uh, we were in a really tough spot. Um, we don't take lightly, nor is it easy, asking for rate support. It is a difficult uh, proposition, and uh, you know, but but it's necessary at times to ensure the long-term you know stability of our organization. As our board, thank you for leaning in with us and providing guidance and leadership. We wouldn't be here uh, if, if this board didn't provide uh, the direction that we need and, and the alignment that we need uh, to do our jobs. We have a plan. That plan will get us, uh, provide us a pathway to the future. Our plan is Vision 2027. We are well on the pathway to implementing the things that we've discussed as priorities uh, for CPS Energy. This request will go a long way to helping us get there and continuing the, mem the momentum we've developed uh, over the last two years. Uh, to my team, I want to say thank you uh, for working hard and doing the work it takes uh, to present uh, a request of this nature. Uh, again, it is not easy, and nobody sees uh, the weeks and months you all have put into this, uh, but I see it, and uh, I appreciate you. Um, and, uh, and that really goes to the entire organization. Uh, and to city staff, uh, and, and our partners over at the city uh, equally. You all have done a lot of work uh, to challenge us in the ways that was necessary uh, to arrive at a request that I think is reasonable uh, and protects affordability and allows us to continue to be the utility this community expects of us. So board members, thank you all uh, for uh, your, your direction and your leadership, and I look forward to our conversation today. Thank you, Rudy. Good afternoon. I'm Elena Ball, CPS Energy's Chief Strategy Officer. Today, we have a number of items that we're going to discuss in our presentation. Um, this is our agenda set forth for, for this presentation. Um, first up, uh, I will give a briefing on our multi-year strategy, as well as discuss our community commitments that we've executed on since our last rate request. At that point in the presentation, I'll turn it over to Corey Kaczynski, who is our CFO, and he will take the group through the remainder of the presentation. So to set the stage uh, for our multi-year strategy, I think it's important to share that we are in a period of rapid transition at both CPS Energy as well as in our industry. We have a need to modernize our systems and our infrastructure, both for our current and our future needs of our customers. Um, as was mentioned both by our CEO Rudy as well as some of the public speakers, we are experiencing continued growth in our community as well as shifts in new technologies across virtually every aspect of our business. As Rudy mentioned, our Vision 2027 is the basis for our strategy and our business plans and as we look out to 2027 and beyond, our multi-year strategy is focused on four key areas. The first key area is our generation plan. We're committed to meeting our re region's energy growth needs reliably while transitioning our generation fleet to cleaner sources of energy. We have over 3,000 megawatts of units that will either be retired or repowered with natural gas in the next five years. We have begun to implement a generation plan that was adopted by the board following a very interactive process with the community and the Rate Advisory Commission. These diverse types of technologies that we are investing in will accelerate our decarbonization while also keeping up with our growth and reliability needs. Also in our multi-year strategy are two companion activities, our digital transformation and our customer experience. As was mentioned earlier, everything that we're doing has our customers at the heart of it. Um, our digital uh, transformation is really establishing a modern system that can allow us to offer new products and services to our customers, as well as eliminate some risks that we have with a core business system that's over two decades old. With this multi-year program, we will modernize our technology, improve our cybersecurity, as well as improve our customers' access to information. In the future, this digital transformation will enable us to offer new products and rate designs that our customers are asking us for. 
The digital transformation program is a significant undertaking and will take several years to implement. However, we are already underway. We are also focused on supporting growth. Our electric system is seeing 145 megawatts of growth annually. That's equivalent to about 30,000 households. So we are focused on expanding not only our generation, but also our transmission, distribution, and gas systems to support reliable operations and to enable more distributed energy resources, such as electric vehicles, customer-sided generation, and energy storage. We also have begun to seek out grant funding opportunities, as well as identify new revenue streams to help defray some of our costs. This multi-year strategy will bring about a significant amount of positive change for our customers and our community. We understand that we must manage these change, changes at a very careful pace so that we minimize the cost impact to our customers, paying especially close attention to the most vulnerable in our community. Just like we did in our last uh, rate request, we have clear commitments we are making to our community. Here are a number of commitments that we made at, at our last rate request. I'm going to touch on a few, um, and you all have seen this slide before, um, but welcome any questions. Um, one of the areas that we, uh, we committed to in addition to the generation plan was approving a new Sustainable uh, for Tomorrow Energy Program, or STEP. Um, in, in partnership with the city and, and city council, we did a, get an approved new step program. This program will reduce 410 megawatts of demand and will weatherize up to 16,000 homes and 20,000 multifamily units. We collected community input. Um, we also used that input as the basis for our plan. We completed an operational efficiency review that went through every aspect of the utilities operation, which was a commitment we made in our last rate request, and are in the process of, of reviewing and implementing up to uh, all 92 recommendations. We've stabilized staffing. While that may not sound exciting to a lot of people, we had reached staffing levels that were ve getting very difficult to serve our customers with the high service levels that we expect. We have stabilized staffing and hired over um, almost 800 people, and the majority of those were frontline workers who ultimately are providing the service to our customers. So we will continue to be transparent and clear in our communications about our progress in each of these four strategic areas. Um, now I will turn it over to Corey Kaczynski, our CFO, for the next part of the presentation. Thank you, Elena, and good afternoon, uh, Chairwoman, good afternoon, trustees. Uh, good to be back again. Um, so just as Elena mentioned, um, you know, we are very forward uh, looking in, in this discussion and want to make sure that that remains um, kind of in focus as we discuss. So this rate request that we've been discussing for the last few weeks uh, is merely a continuation of CPS Energy's journey into the future that we laid out. Um, and as Rudy mentioned and alluded to, you know, this is not a decision that we take lightly. It is something that we have spent um, countless hours, and thank you, as Rudy, you mentioned, thank you to the teams that have spent uh, the hours working on this request, um, and also over at the city side as well for their help. Um, so wanted to acknowledge those. On the next slide, uh, it's information that we've seen before, um, kind of recapped for, for those that may be listening for the first time. Um, the request in front of us today is a 4.25 uh, base rate increase. Uh, it is uh, going to generate approximately $85 million in annual uh, revenue. Uh, the, the average bill impact uh, for a customer who is not on any assistance program is going to be $4.45. And for customers who do income qualify for the uh, uh, affordability discount program, um, our aim here with this recommendation was to offset that increase by about half, so they would see about a $2.42 um, averaging uh, increase on their bill. I will note, and we've talked about this at prior meetings, and we're not going to go into it too much today, um, if you do not qualify for this one particular program, there are countless other programs that we offer in addition to our teams uh, when you call uh, being able to connect you with other organizations. So I'll note that again. And when I speak about the phrase base rate, uh, I am referring specifically, if you're looking at your bill, um, to the service availability charge and the energy charge components of your bill. Uh, this uh, rate request does not include those other line items you may see on your bill. 
We do have an appendix slide in the back, uh, which I'll be happy to um, uh, answer any questions on, that does clarify where on your bill you can see these changes occurring. So on the next slide, uh, we have spoken to this board at length uh, the benefits to the community that comes with this investment. Um, and for those, again, who may be listening for the first time, I will spend just a moment uh, recapping the key, four key areas uh, where this rate request will be invested in and what, from a customer's perspective, you can see. And I think first and foremost, one of the uh, consistent uh, feedback we get from our customers is that they look for reliable uh, and resilient power. Um, and so it's not just that the power is there, but if we do have an outage that we can bounce back quickly. Um, as an example, over the last two years, we spent approximately $90 million reinforcing our power plants uh, for extreme conditions uh, and uh, reinforcing our lines. Much of that work our customers cannot see, um, but is behind the scenes. And this investment goes towards uh, uh, ensuring that we sustain that. From a technology perspective, and Elena alluded to this, um, you know, we are looking to make investments uh, that enable uh, customers to interface with us in a manner that they've asked for. And as she mentioned, new products, new services, all those things um, uh, we want to make sure that we can enable uh, for our customers. And behind the scenes, um, you know, ensuring that our technology that is controlling the power flow across our entire city uh, and controlling our power plants is safe and protected from threats. Uh, talked about, and this was also talked about it, uh, you know, in previous meetings is uh, keeping up with system growth. Um, we all benefit from a power grid that's upgraded and has enough generation to support all of our customers. Uh, this isn't just new customers. This is also about reinvesting in older areas uh, as well when they grow uh, or just need new infrastructure. We all invest, uh, we all benefit from this. And ultimately, uh, uh, service to our customers is a function of having the trained folks that can do the work. Um, as was mentioned in previous meetings as well, um, it can take three to seven years to get folks trained up um, out in the field. Um, you know, our folks don't just show up one day and, and get in a bucket truck and go out there in storms or uh, go out there in extreme conditions. Um, it takes a long time to get our folks ramped up and in the pipeline. Uh, and with the impending retirements we have uh, with our workforce, um, getting going on that and sustaining that investment is necessary. So that's a brief recap on the $85 million and kind of the key areas of investment. So I want to hit on this conversation on past due accounts in a manner that we have not done yet. Uh, we often refer to the total amount past due uh, as $175 million. Uh, that headline number is down from closer to $210 million uh, of a year ago, um, which we've referenced. So progress has been made. And that is great. Um, but I want to uh, step through this because there's more to the story underneath. Looking at this slide from left to right, uh, the biggest point, and I've made this before and Dana has made this as well, is that about $83 million of our total of 175 is actually on payment plans, which means you've got someone who's actively engaged, you've got someone um, that is uh, paying uh, money to CPS Energy for the service that they've gotten. Um, Deanna's team, our customer service team over the last year has been laser focused on getting these customers on plans that they can stick to. And we have an industry high uh, stick to rate, so to speak, of customers uh, who are on those, um, on those accounts. Um, you know, in, in a year's time, or a little over a year, um, that $83 million number used to be in the range of five to $10 million in the past. So just to put that in context, that's an incredible effort that her team is doing, is getting folks lined up uh, on, uh, on something that they can afford. Point number two is in the middle. Um, there are close to $43 million of inactive accounts. Uh, now, these are dollars that are typically in some stage of collection process. And as we've mentioned before and talked about, we have strict requirements that we have to go through to collect on amounts that are owed to us before we can actually just write them off. Um, so this bucket will likely be written off uh, over time as we go through that extensive process. Uh, but at this point, um, the step that would be taken uh, is just an accounting exercise that will occur um, over time. The final point, and probably the main point, and that's why it's in the, the largest box on the right-hand side, is how much then should we be focusing on and really talking about? And that's the nearly $50 million on the right-hand side. Um, and this is where Dana's team is, the customer service team is the most uh, focused on. These are active accounts. These are customers in, in our community um, that are receiving our service. They're active. Um, but in many cases, they are past due or they're past due enough to actually be eligible for, for disconnection. And, uh, you know, one of a few things can happen for folks in this bucket. 
Um, the first one is that Deanna's team can get to them, whether she's doing block walk-in or out at a consumer, uh, a customer fair. She can get them hooked up on a payment plan. And what that means is they'll go from that far right bucket all the way over to the left bucket, which means they're now on a payment plan, which is good. The other option is, well, we get to them and, um, you know, we have to disconnect them. And in 95% of the time, that individual who does get disconnected is going to call us right back, same day, call her team in the call center, um, and make a payment and get on a plan, which means 95% of those folks are getting in that left-hand bucket as well. The other 5% are going to go into the middle. They'll probably be in some level of collections, um, and eventually we'll have to go down that path of writing off. Now, the other thing to note, and we've talked about this, is weather permitting. Uh, Deanna's team uh, uh, is also disconnecting approximately 10,000 customers per month. And if we're wondering how that compares, uh, that is above pre-COVID levels. So all in all, um, it really is a combination of kind of compassion and, and diligence mixed with a level of enforcement. And our teams are doing the best to try to balance those two elements over the last couple of years. Uh, so that all being said, the last point that I've made before is that those amounts on payment plans are in fact uh, included in the future forecast that we have put out there for our rate request. So those are accounted for in that manner. So past due accounts, they're not zero. They never will be. Um, but the focus number of past due accounts shouldn't also be $175 million, uh, either. Um, it should be understood that we're not unique in having these challenges to manage through, but it should also be known that our teams that are getting out there are working as hard as anybody in the industry, and they're getting impressive results, and that's what this slide is showing. Now, this next slide is a slide that we're very familiar with. This is how our electric and gas bills um, compare to other major uh, markets within the state of Texas. Again, we're using this... Um, this benchmark view, which is uh, from readily available data that we're able to get across the state um, at standard usage levels that are used for comparison purposes. And to the question you asked at the last meeting, Mayor, when you tack on the four and a quarter uh, request, you can see that um, our bills still remain very competitive. In this instance, the lowest in these major markets. Uh, and, you know, wanted to take the opportunity to point that out for, for those who may be listening for the first time. So on this next slide, the impact of our financial metrics uh, with the four and a quarter increase are, are shown here. Uh, now there's no change um, from the last meeting on the ratios for the columns that have fiscal 25 and fiscal 26. What is new on this slide is showing the latest estimate over on the left um, for this fiscal year, fiscal year 24. Now, you know, the punchline is there's really no surprise here. These metrics are uh, better than we had forecasted at the beginning of the year. Uh, but we spoke about that at the previous meeting uh, as to why. Um, we talked about how we saw strong wholesale sales um, over this, uh, this summer. Um, I also spoke about how we were uh, thinking of applying those additional dollars. And ultimately, I spoke about how that performance contributed to the reduced request of four and a quarter instead of our previously planned 5.5% uh, that we've been talking about uh, from a couple of years ago. So the strength that you see uh, in this latest estimate is, in fact, what is carrying forward in the future years. Um, and not to be a spoiler alert for the December 18th meeting when we do our quarter three update, but these are going to be the same latest estimate numbers that we will show for that standard, um, that standard review as well. So point number one, uh, this year's performance has underpinned um, all of our rate request forecasts that we have discussed. Um, the other element that I'd point out, uh, it may look like our metrics are going down, um, but the point is they remain competitive and in the ranges that will allow our borrowing costs to remain competitive, which is the ultimate point of maintaining these elements, these financial metrics. And the other question that you may ask is, um, you know, why don't we stay at today's levels? They're pretty high levels that we haven't seen in the past. The answer is what I said earlier. We do not need to be at these high levels in order to still borrow competitively which is the end objective of what financial help does for us. Um, if we did, in fact, try and stay at those higher levels, what it would mean for our customers is we would need a higher rate increase. And if we did want to keep an elevated uh, financial metrics like that, it means that we'd have to take money out of our customer's pocket and we'd have to park it on the sidelines just so that we could say we have additional financial cushion. And that just doesn't make sense to, to pull money out of our customers' pockets and not have it go to work. And so this is us putting our money to work while still maintaining the competitiveness that we have in the financial markets from a borrowing perspective.
So the other item that I talked about, the last board meeting that we've heard um, also over at City Council, um, was uh, a regulatory asset uh, that we will also be asking for approval on. Um, I spent some time distinguishing how this is different than the conversation we had two years ago. The key point on this is highlighted. Um, this change, this regulatory asset, does not increase the cost of uh, to any of our customers, and it's not going to increase the customer bill. That's kind of point one. The other point that I'll stress that I didn't hit as much last time was this approach that we're talking about um, has benchmarked has been benchmarked rather against peer utilities. We've determined it to be a best practice. And we've also taken this uh, recommendation in front of our external auditors to ensure that they've reviewed it. And we've gone through all of that. Um, ultimately, uh, this is regulatory accounting. We are allowed to do regulatory accounting, but it does require a different level of pr approval, which is why we're having this separate conversation both here at the Board of Trustees and we'll have it over at City Council as well. So again, the, the Board of Trustees, you have seen this slide multiple times, and it supports the conversation that we have had about being future focused uh, and having a multi-year rate plan um, that supports what Elena talked about at the beginning, a multi-year strategy. So that discussion is consistent from two years ago, and it remains true today. Uh, you can see uh, we currently have forecasted in fiscal 27 um, up to 5.5%. Um, but again, all forecasts are subject to change based on real life performance and outcomes. So as I wrap up here, um, you know, the last couple of years, um, and Rudy has mentioned this before, it's been about stabilizing CPS energy and getting us focused and looking ahead to the future. So in order to continue down that path um, and achieve all the goals that we've discussed at length uh, with the Board of Trustees and the community, um, continuing support uh, with the resources uh, to actually get the job done um, is really critical. Um, so uh, I appreciate the time, um, Chairwoman Gonzalez, and I appreciate the time to all of the trustees. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to you, Chair, um, for the, the final request for approval for these two items. Thank you. Okay. I, I just want to make sure. Um, these would be two votes, two separate votes. I just want to make sure that all trustees understand that. So we will now move to vote on each recommended item separately. Do I have a motion to approve the 4.25 base rate increase? Oh, sorry. Is there a motion? Yeah. The motion first. <laughs> and then is there? And I just want to right. clarify. Yeah. Uh, they're, list, they're listed in order. So uh, is there a, a motion to um, implement the regulatory asset for employee benefits accounting? We'll take first. Is there such a motion? So moved. And I'll second the motion. Is there a discussion now? Mr. Steen? Well, <clears throat> just to clarify, this is just, just uh, on the regulatory yes, asset. Sir. Okay. No, those are be two separate votes, sir. It's important that I believe there should be two separate votes. Did you have any discussion on that? No, ma'am. Any discussion on that item? Get a roll call. Go ahead and pull the trustees. Trustee Dr. Mackey? Yes. Trustee Steen? Yes. Mayor? Yes. Vice Chair? Yes. Chair? Yes. Motion yes. to approve the regulatory asset carries. Okay. So now we'll move, uh, I'm sorry, to vote on the recommended uh, rate increase of 4.25 base rate. Is there a motion? I move to um, increase the base rate by 4.25 percent. Is there a second? I have a second by Dr. Mackey. Open for discussion. Mr. Steen? Um, I've, I've got a fairly, fairly, all right. Um, let me say that so um, I've been placed in a difficult position today and let me begin by expressing my disappointment with so many of the decisions made by CPS Energy over the last two years that is since the last base rate increase of 3.85 percent was approved January 10th 2022 uh, please put up slide eight.
From a financial point of view, I am disappointed with the intractable customer debt situation where the latest numbers provided us indicate the figure is at $175.5 million with 193,000, 193,000 or 23 percent of CPS Energy's residential customers in arrears. I began sounding the alarm about this in early 2022, and despite our CEO's optimistic assurances at that time that it would soon be cleared up, we are worse off today than we were then. Uh, as I pointed out repeatedly, this account receive receivable situation is a clear signal of how financially distressed almost a quarter of our residential customers are, which is a critical fact to keep in mind during rate hike deliberations. So please put up slide 10. From a big three metrics point of view, I'm disappointed uh, CPS Energy's debt capitalization ratio, which is our leverage metric and where lower is better, continues to exceed the 60 percent threshold and dismayingly is projected to increase to 67.9 percent in fiscal year 2029, even with the planned every two-year rate hikes baked in. And Mr. Kajinsa, you, you can correct me if I have misstated that, but I believe I got that information from a five-year forecast version of metric charts that you provided us uh, via email on November 26th. Yes, as I mentioned, the debt capitalization ratio um, we project going up uh, in the future, and that aligns with the period of high investment that we're talking about. Um, and in conjunction with that, though, I have also said the other two metrics, um, which have a little higher weighting with the rating agencies, we have focused on keeping those in the, the strong area. So they all work together, not individually. Uh, but you are correct, sir, on the, the debt capitalization ratio. We do have that trending uh, upwards. Over the next decade, uh, that coincides with the approximate $14 billion in investment that we need to make and support our, our generation plan. Thank you, Mr. Gajinski. Um, also, please note our day's cash on hand, uh, CPS Energy's liquidity metric, where higher is better, con continues its descending trajectory. Uh, from a CPS Energy Tier 1 metrics point of view, I'm disappointed that last fiscal year the company's overall score was 10 out of 16, that is a, 60, a 63, which is a D, on what's often referred to as CPS Energy's report card, and that the company's reaction to that score was not to take this as a challenge to try even harder and perform better this fiscal year, but instead to lower expectations, that is, move the goalpost closer. I want to stress that we should at all times and in every way be striving for excellence and not accept or abide mediocrity. From a governance point of view, I'm disappointed by the process, or more accurately, the lack of process, when our permanent CEO was selected in September of last year, and by the dismantling of our senior executive compensation program that's contributed to the decimation of our senior leadership team with CPS Energy in recent years having lost seven of its eight highest ranking representatives, seven of, of its eight highest ranking executives. The, the growing financial burden that this proposed 4.25 percent rate hike will place on CPS Energy customers has been brought about by spending decisions recommended by management and approved by a majority of this board. And just two examples. The first example, in May of last year, CPS Energy had the opportunity to ease the financial pressure on its customers by, at a minimum, pausing the Energy Efficiency and Conservation Initiative called STEP, which was originally a 10-year program that st staff announced had reached its goals two years before. Because this STEP charge, or what, what some have dubbed the STEP tax, represents an average of 3 to point to 4.5 percent of a customer's bill, suspending the program would have for many customers essentially negated the 3.85 percent increase implemented March 1, 2022. And granted, there had been a lag, but this would have happened. Nevertheless, it was decided to plow ahead with it, notwithstanding that I, as well as the plurality of the RAC members and three city council members, favored a pause. The cost of extending this program was pegged at $70 million a year for five years, or $350 million. This on top of the $800 million already spent on the program. Unbelievably, CPS Energy is now on track to spend a billion dollars on STEP. 
My second example is a generation plan that was adopted by this board on a four to one vote earlier this year, specifically on January 23rd, 2023. In the midst of significant financial stress, both on the company and on our customers, for reasons related to deadlines set forth in the P Paris Climate Accords and the City of San Antonio's 2019 Climate Action and Adaptation Plan, CAP, this board decided to close, convert our remaining coal-fired plants. Following the recommendation of management, this board agreed to shutter the Spruce 1 coal plant by the end of 2028 and to convert the Spruce 2 coal plant to run on natural gas by 2027. But focusing on the closure of Spruce Run, let's recall it was placed in service in 1992 with the expectation that it would operate until 2047. Thus, the board's January 23rd decision, it will be shut down some 20 years early. The financial people call this stranding an asset, and the financial impact on CPS Energy will not be insignificant. Further, shutting down Spruce 1 will remove 466 megawatts of baseload power and seriously crimp CPS Energy's ability to sell excess power in the wholesale market. Recall that earlier this year we made $200 million selling power in the wholesale market, four times the $50 million that was budgeted, and now we're moving along a path that will wreak havoc on CPS Energy's ability to do this in the coming years. As a former longtime CPS Energy employee characterized this plan to me, he said, taking out this 566 megawatts is shooting ourselves in the foot. And it should also be noted that Spruce 2's 178 megawatts will be unavailable during the years it will not be in operation while the conversion to natural gas takes place. Now, consider the example of Austin Energy and its Fayette Power Project, a coal-fired power plant near LaGrange put into service in 1980, making it 12 years older than CPS Energy's Spruce One coal plant. In 2020, the Austin City Council adopted an emissions reduction plan that called for its city-owned utility, Austin Energy, to shutter its portion of the Fayette coal plant by the end of 2022. That shutdown goal was missed, and last August 17th, Austin Energy made $11 million from that plant that one day. So to repeat, $11 million in one day. So in an August public meeting, Austin Energy's general manager said it was time for a, quote, course correction, close quote, to reevaluate how quickly Austin will get off coal power. And Austin Energy spokesman summarized it this way, I'm quoting, not having the coal plant revenues to offset costs would mean those millions of dollars would be passed through to Austin Energy's customers. As far as being generally disappointed with how CPS Energy has been managed in recent years, I have one additional point to make. There was a time from 2019 to 2021, a period of three years, when without fail, at every single monthly board meeting, it was on the agenda that the board received a presentation on how CPS was cutting costs and saving money. This fostered a company culture of belt tightening and financial prudence. Re regretfully, in January of 2021, that monthly agenda item disappeared and the culture seemed to shift from saving money to finding more and more ways to spend money. Unfortunately, discussion of how all these spending commitments are going to be paid for it's not always been front and center. It's how we got to where we are today, not only evaluating a 4.25% base rate increase that's currently before us, but getting locked into base rate increases every two years for the foreseeable future. It's something I want our customers to understand when they read about monumental and ambitious programs and ideas. Make no mistake, ultimately you're going to have to fund them, and over the coming years it's going to cost you dearly. However, notwithstanding all these disappointments, I must keep in mind my duties and responsibilities as a trustee, particularly the duty of care. Two considerations weigh heavily on my mind. First, the fact that over the past two years, CPS Energy has committed itself to expending significant sums of money begging the question, how, how is all this spending going to be paid for? As indicated earlier, I've opposed many of these major spending decisions as evidenced by four to one votes. 
But given that these commitments have been made, can I in good faith oppose the funding of them? As CEO Rudy Garza has said repeatedly, there are only two fundamental ways to pay by taking on more debt, which is perilous and which I'm averse to doing given CPS Energy's already out of kilter debt capitalization ratio, or by increasing the base rate on CPS Energy's customers. Second, management, whenever it formally proposes a base rate increase before us, or when, whenever it formally brings a base rate increase before us, sets CPS Energy up for further credit downgrades if that proposed hike is rejected. One of the areas I've been repro reproachful about the past three years is management's inability to restore our ratings from Fitch, Moody's, and S&P to where they were before Winter Storm Uri, or at the minimum to get the negative outlooks assigned by Fitch and S&P upgraded to positive, or at the very least to stable. By moving forward with this rate hike, management has placed me in something of a bind, and just to borrow a cliche, I find myself on the horns of a dilemma. But considering the above begrudgingly, I'm going to go ahead and support the base rate increase that's before us. My responsibility as a trustee to make sure provisions are made so that bills get paid must outweigh my misgivings about the direction this company has been taking the past two years. Simply put, CPS Energy has been committed to a spending spree, and it has to be bankrolled. The piper must be paid, and the cost to CPS Energy's customers as these every two-year rate hikes are implemented is going to be a high one. If different decisions had been made over the past two years, perhaps we wouldn't be where we are today, which is voting to increase the cost burden on our already beleaguered, beleaguered customers. And, and, and Madam Chair, uh, finally, I respectfully ask that the reasoning behind my vote today be summarized in the minutes of today's meeting. Absolutely, Mr. Steen. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. And additional comments? Dr. Romero? Um, as usual, I have several questions. So I guess I'll start with Corey. Um, you know I'm going to ask about slide 24. Um, I carry my bill around with me. I print it out and carry it around with me because I get confused sometimes about the different things that we pay for. And I think it's confusing. And we can talk all we want, but, but this is the common language between all of us and the customers, the shareholders. So I wish we could talk in this language more. And I know you put this in here. I wish it looked like the actual bill, because I know there was a slide that looked like the actual bill. Um, but this, this is what people look at. Um, so can you just explain? When people see this on their bill, so service availability charge, we always see $9.10, and now we're all going to see $9.50. So that's the same for every customer, correct? Correct. And then can you explain uh, how energy charge, which is the second part of this bill increase, uh, will change if this is approved? Yeah, absolutely. And you're calling out those two sections there. The energy charge, it's a little small font there. You can see the Per unit, 7.2% is increasing to 7.5% cents. Sorry, um, and that is um, that's reflected there on the slide, and it's still multiplied by the same usage. But effectively, those two in combination <clears throat> are what we call as base rate, um, and those are responsible for you know recovery of um, of those costs um, to run the business. They are separate and apart and uniquely different than the other components that you point out that we see in our bill, whether it be the fuel adjustment, which is the other line item, uh, which is, and we've talked at length what that is, that's truly the fuel that we use to support our power plants um, or our distribution system if you're a gas customer. And then, of course, the other item, that's the regulatory adjustment component, um, which these are to pay for, um, as it sounds like, regulatory costs across the state um, that are imposed upon us. Uh, again, we don't control those. So when we come to the community, we only ask for what we um, can control, and that's going to be the base rate. And those are going to be that those two items, that service availability charge, which is a fixed charge on every customer's bill. Um, it doesn't recover all of our fixed costs as a percentage, and we've talked about that. Um, the energy charge, though, this is why we say your bill impact can vary, uh, because it depends on what you use. 
um, you know, everyone's got a different usage. So it'll just be multiplied by a, a slightly larger factor that you can tell. Hopefully that helps a little bit, Trustee, and uh, I appreciate you pointing that out, um, uh, Dr. Romero. It's helpful. I, I just kept thinking how we just keep saying base rate, and if somebody looked at their bill, they're going to say, I don't see anything that says base rate. That's right. So, we will continue to call that out. Uh, and I, there's, a, there's a great page on the website that, mm -hmm. that has your bill and shows you what every single item there is. And mm -hmm. I have it marked, but today I was trying to find it from the home page, and it was way too hard because you have to go from the home page, then you go to understanding your bill, and then the next thing you click on, which is what threw me, is bill help. Because I thought that meant, oh, that's for people who need help paying their bill. It can't be there. But it was there. So four clicks to get to how to read your residential bill. And I would like to know if we can get that down to two clicks. We'll take that back. And that yep. it should not be under something that says bill help. Completely confusing. Understood. OK, thank you. I think my next questions are for Deanna. Um, the last time we, you talked about how uh, this, with this rate increase, that I think an additional 15,000 customers would qualify for ADP. Yes, ma'am. So can you go over again how we are how we are paying for that? Is it in the rate increase itself that the other customers are paying? Yes. I want to make sure with my financial friends. Okay. Um, Both commercial and residential. Not just residential. Okay. All customers pay for that. I'm sorry, Dr. Romero, can you restate the question and then restate the, the, the response, please? The, the question was whether uh, the expansion of ADP to an additional 15,000 customers was, is being financed by the rate increase itself. Yes, and it's going to be uh, on average 80 cents per residential bill. Which is already part of this. Correct. Real quick, can you, uh, for those who may not know the acronym ADP, can you please state what ADP stands yes, for? Yes, ma'am. That is the Affordability Discount Program. And so it's, uh, you get a standard discount on your electric bill or electric and gas, depending on which uh, of, your, of our services that you use, if you qualify. Thank you. Sorry about that, Dr. Romero. I just want to make sure. Not everybody may know the acronym. Now, I know that you are adding an additional qualification which is ener energy burden. Yes, ma'am. To ADP, ADP. Sorry, now we got the acronym out. I can say ADP. Um, so I just want to make it clear. I know that the energy, the high energy burden is more likely with low income households. But if you can just clarify that if you are a high income household, you cannot qualify because of a high energy burden. You have to have the low income and the high energy burden. Yes, ma'am, that is absolutely correct. Uh, we ask that you meet two qualifications, and the first of which is based on income. Okay. Um, it, it seems to me, I, I know that Rack had talked a little bit before about whether um, getting a home energy audit should be required um, before you can be enrolled in ADP. And, and I was never in favor of that. But as we add this additional qualification of the energy burden, which seems really closely related to the energy audit, which could help with that high energy burden. I wondered if you've considered, maybe it's our decision in the end, um, but if there's been any discussion about making Casa Verde enrollment be required now with ADP. Uh, what we have said is that's one of the, if someone wants to qualify or does want to go through it, that's part of the uh, bundled care approach. It would not be a requirement, but it's definitely part of the bundled care approach for when we do enroll a customer in ADP, that we don't just focus on uh, the affordability discount program, but we focus on all other additional programs that they would qualify for, including the Casa Verde, starting with the energy assessment. I just feel like if we're adding energy burden, that maybe cost severity should be required. I don't know if we'll ever get to discuss that or, or vote on it, but it just seems a little bit different to me than the others. Thank you, ma'am. So then, um, looking at ADP versus REAP, and I understand that I see that the eligibility requirements are pretty much the same, 
and that ADP actually enrolls you in a discount every month, whereas REAP gives you a, a lump sum every year. I don't really understand why we have two different programs, and I'm just wondering if there's inefficiencies in running two separate programs like that, and if that's a place where we could save a little bit of money. That's a great question. The one value of having REAP is that it's a nonprofit and that we can get donations and it is specifically targeted for customers who have a past due account. So the additional assistance they get is based on uh, their need of, uh, for past due accounts. Uh, and what we can do is look at what, what the cost is for, for REAP as well as ADP to see if there's some type of combination. But ADP is something that we fund solely here at CPS Energy, where REAP is an opportunity for others to make uh, donations through uh, as, an, as a nonprofit. Would it be impossible to keep that nonprofit status and let people make donations, but then use that money just for to finance ADP instead of doing a whole separate payment system? REAP is a separate uh, entity, but we can see what the opportunities are. I would defer to from a legal perspective on what opportunities we have. Okay. Is it fair for me to say one is employee driven, employee community driven? whereas the other one is funded it's also it's funded by ratepayers they volunteer ADP. is that a better distinction adp is paid specifically by the company where oh, by the company the other one is employees Re is, uh, is a combination of, of employee and community from us as well as from okay. others in the so company I, I just wanted to maybe help with the distinction i was also going to give you a little bit of sizing too dr romero um, for the adp program currently as it exists today it costs around 11 or 12 million dollars in total for that program. Um, right now, the REAP has about 13 to 15 million dollars in it right now. Um, so size-wise, um, you know, there's uh, there's a difference in that, and the ADP gives you, you know, currently about 16 bucks a month um, for customers. And you know, to your point on REAP, it's more of a lump sum. So, you know, um, the size of REAP could be eaten through pretty quickly if we didn't have uh, kind of the ADP mechanism. But I think Deanna pointed out good distinction. It is a, a, a not-for-profit with the, the joint um, uh, partnership with the city and the county, which also helps for different elements of outreach that we otherwise wouldn't have. But anyway, it's just a little bit extra color, hopefully, at those points. Okay, thank you. I just have a couple more questions. Um, I, I thought there was just a little bit of confusion at council, so I just want to clarify. Um, you held a community resource fair in every single council district, correct? Yes, ma'am. And those weren't town halls. There, there weren't really town halls, except for the online one that was last week. But you... We did have, we had community fairs, and there were some council members that specifically asked us to hold town halls as well. So we can follow up and give you that list if we haven't already provided it of where we did an actual town hall where a council member uh, invited us versus where we had a community fair. Oh, OK. No, I have the list. There were okay. so many that it's hard to read. So yes, Sam. I don't know how much you did. Um, and then I just had a couple of questions for Rudy. Um, these are things that I, I know. I, I wouldn't feel comfortable being here today if I didn't know these already. But I, I wanted to give you a chance to address some things that I thought were brought up at the B session, and you didn't really get a chance to address them. Um, so one was um, this, this rate increase doesn't fix the grid. And so yeah. how does it help our <laughs> citizens despite that? Well, she, I, I try to be respectful of how the council members ask the question, so I answered it the way she asked it, yes or no. Uh, you know, there are a lot of things about the ERCOT grid that we don't control in San Antonio. But the, the more reliable CPS energy is, the better off for the, for the ERCOT grid. So us being the best that we can be and being as long, you know, in generation as makes sense for our community, you know, we can't go overboard with that. We can't build all the generation the state of Texas needs in San Antonio and burden our customers with that cost in the hopes that we're going to get paid back. It's just not reasonable. But there does make sense to be 20, 25 percent, you know, reserve margin, which gives us flexibility for resiliency purposes and allows us to sell power back into the market to help with ERCOT's resiliency. So we do contribute to ERCOT's resiliency overall when we're resilient. But, but if we get into a yuri like event where there are wide-scale power outages across ERCOT, we can't solve for that. 
So when ERCOT is in distress, we are in distress as well. Okay, thank you. Um, and the, the last one, um, you started talking a little bit about uh, the costs that would be associated with keeping the spruce plants running. It's all the other things that we already decided we weren't going to and all the reasons why we wouldn't want to, but uh, you had started talking about how it's, it's not just a matter of saying, oh, we can just keep making all this money and generating all this power, that there are actually costs involved in keeping them going. Yes, ma'am, and, and let me just make a comment about kind of the sequence of how, you know, you got to look at the, big pic at the whole picture of our generation plan. We will be bringing on over the next five to 10 years, 5,000 megawatts of new capacity. You know, what we're replacing is about 2,500 megawatts of old capacity, which includes the spruce units. Spruce two being converted to natural gas will keep that asset running and allow us to fully depreciate that asset. So take spruce two off the, uh, off the table. That will continue running as a natural gas plant. And it's only about 60 days uh, to, con to we, we basically build all the pipeline infrastructure we need to, to convert it to natural gas, Trustee Steen, and in one outage, 60-day outage, we, you know, we convert it over to, to natural gas, and we'll have that work done before the Spruce 1 unit uh, is retired. But to keep the Spruce 1 unit a viable unit long-term would have to invest $200 million. Utilities have to make these decisions all the time. Do you invest that type of environmental you know, controls into a 30-year-old power plant, or do you do something different with that $200 million? It's, a, it's, a, it's an inflection point to keep it running for another 15, 20 years if the environmental laws don't change that make it even more difficult to run fossil fuel plants. You know, you'd be making a bet on, whether, on the future of whether or not Spruce One's gonna be able to run for another 20 years. So, so again, while there may be some, some underappreciated assets in Spruce, in the Spruce One decision, the cost it takes to keep it running in terms of environmental controls outweighs what you're gonna what you're gonna write off. So financially, shutting Spruce One down is the right decision. Okay, thank you. I have some comments, but I'm done with Go my ahead. questions, so sure. I can. Yeah. You, you, can do your you want me to do my comments yeah. too? All right. We, we have plenty of time, so please go ahead. Comments, yes, ma'am. Okay, so I, I wanted to make some comments um, toward the end of explaining my, my vote, uh, which will be in support. I don't want to sit up here and lecture anybody in the community or certainly anybody here about the right way to do things, but I want to explain my vote from my perspective. As I know my colleagues do, I take this role very seriously, and part of my responsibility is to explain my vote to the community who at least indirectly placed me in this position. I believe the role of trustees is to serve as the advocate for the shareholders of this community-owned utility. And I know that the leadership team and, and everybody who works here is committed to that end. These people are public servants who could be making a lot more money in the private sector. They are really brilliant leaders. And I'm really impressed with all the work um, that's, that's gone into this. And I, have, I believe they have a special commitment to serve. That is not to say I automatically accept all information they present us, obviously, um, as another part of our responsibility is to question the leadership team and to ask for improvements where we think they are needed. Um, clearly, the cost of this will have an impact on many customers, but the costs represented by this rate case are only one sliver of costs and potential costs. Furthermore, the benefit that those costs support cannot be left out of the equation. So I just want to mention two themes that justify my decision beyond simply saying that this increase in income is, is warranted through a cost-benefit comparison. I'm trying to find my other notes. Okay. Um, the first thing I've been noticing lately is just this really complex web of connections among all the factors that have gone into, again, a very nuanced cost-benefit analysis that the leadership team conducted. Um, going back to the last rate increase, we saw a slide on that, and I, I, I agree that we would not fulfill the promises made at that time without continuing on as this plan outlines. That would be stranded costs in and of itself if we were to stop now. Another example is that this increase will help to fund our move to increase renewables per the approved generation plan, 
which in turn will bring the benefit of greater resiliency to adapt to the growing climate crisis. And we know that's a benefit that our citizens want. They've been very vocal about that. Another connection here is with the rating agencies. Um, somebody at council asked Ben Gorzell, what could help us to sustain or improve our ratings? His answer was passing this rate increase. And that in turn allows our debt service costs to remain relatively low. And finally, one more example is what I just asked Deanna about, how the increased number of customers to be added to ADP is financed by this rate increase itself. Um, I believe that reflects a strategic balance between having customers who are less burdened support those who, who are, but without giving all of us too much to support. So I, I really appreciate that balance. Um, there's a project and a report, it's called Powerless in the US, and it's um, from the Center for Biological Diversity, which seems strange, but that's where it's from and some other nonprofits. And um, it talks about the equity uh, with the huge number of delinquencies across the United States and how uh, some utilities are not paying enough attention to that. And some of the warning signs that they talk about uh, are all things that we are not doing. So the things they talk about looking for is if, if a utility does not disclose delinquencies or, or termination of power, uh, if there are high bonuses being given to the leadership team, if there has been no move to renewables, if there is no stop out on disconnections for extreme heat, because many states have that for cold but not for heat, if there is a lack of payment plans. So we're doing all those things in the right direction according to that group whose mission right now is, is looking at the equity of higher bills and disconnections. The only thing that they suggest that we don't do is simply forgiving delinquencies. We can't do that unless the state constitution changes. So my second theme is how this rate increase keeps us on the crucial path to meeting the future head on. I don't know what happened in previous years, but I don't think that challenge was considered seriously enough. Now it is, and I think it's really important since we know that climate change is coming at us faster and hotter and sometimes icier than we ever anticipated. Rising to the future is always cheaper and less disruptive in the long run than putting things on hold. For example, some people have asked why we can't just keep the spruce plants running longer, and I believe we just got a really good answer for that. Even setting aside the climate crisis and the irresponsibility of delaying uh, decarbonization, um, it just it doesn't make financial sense. These are costs that would not sustain us into the future as investments and renewables will. Another important aspect of this is continuing uh, to invest in and build uh, ERP Evolve. This gets us to, among a multitude of other improvements, the all-important cybersecurity needs and more flexible billing methods that will give customers more power in managing their own energy burden. So uh, my point is all, in all this is that a full, analysis, a full analysis, which is what's been done, of the impact of a rate increase must include all of these factors. I believe that's been provided here. And in my opinion, a vote for this rate increase means support for a ne necessary investment in a sustainable and equitable future. Thank you, Dr. Romero. Mayor or Dr. Mackey? I concur with uh, Dr. Romero. You just answered all my questions. You did a wonderful job explaining and this, and I concur with it. Thank you. Mayor? Sure, I would, uh, ditto, uh, very well stated. Um, you know, the cost of not investing in our community asset is that it won't be there when we need it, and we know the costs of that and the impacts of it. Um, you know, I do remember uh, us for years and years and years talking about the flex bundle plan. Do you remember that phrase? That was a, I'll, I'm not misusing the phrase, but it was a black box in terms of what the future would be in terms of our energy mix. The difference is we now actually have a plan. It didn't mean that when we were talking about flex bundle, we weren't going to have to invest in it. 
Uh, it just meant we didn't have the answers to the questions. We have done the work, the community has done the work to come up with the answers and the priorities that we have together as a community in an equitable manner. And this is the plan that we have to invest in to both need the, meet the needs of our capacity uh, demands uh, to ensure that we have a reliable and diverse energy portfolio to make sure that we are also meeting our metrics on uh, keeping this utility the most affordable in the state, if not the country. Uh, we're doing all those things. Um, I appreciate uh, Henrietta's comments. Um, I'll work on the day, Henrietta. Um, but you're, you're right. Uh, I could take a survey in my neighborhood. I could take a survey in any of the hundreds of neighborhoods in the city, and there will be 0% of people who, in, who want this rate increase. But the reality is what we want and what we need to do are sometimes different. If we do not uh, invest in our utility, um, the cost of that will be a burden on every single uh, household in this community, most, uh, uh, most dramatically being our lowest income, uh, most vulnerable members of our community. Um, last thing, I don't want it to go uncorrected. A vast majority of the RAC, which is a reflection of this community, wanted a STEP program. Um, there was a, a group of folks within the RAC that said we want to move on from a STEP, but a vast majority wanted some type of, of STEP program to continue. Um, how much was a debate, but we wanted a STEP program. And I will say that this new STEP program finally allows lower income households to benefit from it. And that's not a, 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 that's not a temporary benefit either because the, the majority of those folks who are benefiting are seeing home efficiency improvements that will allow their energy bills to decrease. Um, that's really important. And making sure that lower income residents are no longer subsidizing those who have a capital to access those, those efficiency programs is important to the city council. It's important to every member of, uh, of the, the community, the RAC, and I am very happy that it's in place. So uh, again, we have a plan. Uh, if we want to stick to the plan, that means we've got to make the proper investments uh, as a community. And, and uh, again, not an easy vote, uh, but it's important that we make sure our, our utility can stand on its, on its feet. So, and, and I do want to say thank you to uh, the CPS Energy staff, uh, the folks on the front lines, uh, all the way to the leadership team, you've done a great job. And this utility is in a stronger position, much stronger position, uh, than when we started this process three or four years ago. So um, that's all from me, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, I do have a couple of questions. Um, I want to start with uh, the opening slide, I believe, Ms. Ms. Elena Ball. I just want to make sure we can go over to the opening slide. I believe it was a slide that had spoke about aligning our strategic financial plan with community needs. I mean, I have questions yet, but I at least wanted to start with that slide. I think it was the other one before that. Okay, maybe not. Okay. So I, I will tell you that I was a freshman um, when I started seeing a major uh, start became very aware that there was obviously a disconnect between what I was hearing in the community and what was happening at CPS. And so I know there's a lot of reference to the past. And I want to say that I do believe that this process has honored the past. As we've listened to the future, I will tell you that I'm very mindful of everybody's feedback on this board. I mean, I will be the first to tell you that it's easier to be a trustee than it is to be a chairman. I've learned a lot. I've grown a lot this year. I will tell you that, you know, I'm an executor. I'm a CEO. And so oftentimes your job is, is to develop a plan and to make sure you execute and make some really tough decisions, even when they're not popular. And I will tell you that I do apologize to some of my colleagues when I've had to lean in really hard to, to execute what I heard as a freshman and when I started hearing it as a role as a vice chair and then hearing it as a chairman. I attended the B session. I've attended many meetings, both online and offline. Here are a couple of the common themes. We need a community, we need a, a community advocate. 
we got to be careful, more burden to, to, to less fortunate individuals. We got to be very you know, thoughtful about that. Don't forget our seniors. I've also heard some, some very conservative point of views of why should we pay for others' sins. We need, to be, we need to be more aggressive in how we collect. I've also heard many times, you know, our, our key metrics, you know, are not going in the direction that they should. The need for third-party assessment. Uh, the need to, to move away from coal. The need to be flexible in, in, in the generation mix. The need to, you know, um, provide more end users with more power, whether it's features and functions. The need to advertise in Spanish and English. The need to go into the community. There's been so many things. And I will tell you that I'm a small business owner, and I wish I would have had a, an advocate when my interest rates went up several times in a year. It was really, really tough. I will tell you, I could empathize with large organizations and small organizations and even my employees that were struggling to try to figure out how we as a company were going to offset all of a sudden these costs that we could not recuperate from, from our customers. So there's a lot of things. I live in the poorest district. I see it every day. But I will tell you a lot of things that I'm proud of. I am proud of that we challenge the marketing team. The marketing team was challenged from making sure every time there was feedback from Dr. Romero about being user friendly, making sure information was there. We were challenged, Mr. Steen wanted to make sure the calculator was there to make sure that people understood it got done. We were challenged to be creative and how we were out there in the community. I will tell you, I would walk into HUB 30s, I believe it was number 37, the, the biggest, the most popular HUB on Southwest Military Drive, I think it's 36. You walk in, and you see immediately CPS, we can help you with the little white bees. I walked into the workforce centers this year, and every workforce center had a brochure. Walked into the Dollar General store, and I got a, a re, there's a receipt, how, how we can help you. I will tell you they've been challenged in different capacities by different board of trustees, and, and you heard the call. Um, I will tell you that I'm really proud of the work of RAC and the outcomes that came out of it, some of the feedback, we've incorporated that into the plan that we have for Vision 2027. Thank you for that. You know, again, a lot of meaningful conversations. Yes, the format was changed and how we run meetings today. But I will tell you something that I'm most proud of as well. We, we have a process at CPS under the current leadership, which is myself, that if any board member any board member wants an ask of information that wasn't clear, wants a report, I get a list. I get a list. Every month we go over it and I'm like, please address that trustee's request. Please make sure it's closed out. Move it into a committee. So I will tell you that I hear you and I've incorporated, as a matter of fact, 30 action items were closed this year of requested information by trustees. So we have increased transparency. We have increased listening in different formats and listening to our community. Um, but why I want you back to this, to this slide is I kind of want you, you've walked us through some couple of key areas. I've kind of highlighted these areas. And so part of working with you as, as the chairman has been, one, slides need to be improved. <laughs> they need to be simple to the point and meaningful content. So thank you very much. But if you can share something that you have not pointed out or that any of our colleagues has not pointed out right today that has been delivering a, a commitment that wasn't there a year ago or two years ago. Um, yes, thank you for the question. Um, I, I will say that I think um, everything on this slide, there were some, there, there are many of these areas that we had not had a plan for, right? So everything on this slide, uh, in some in some nuanced way is is new and is something that you know we have have delivered on um, I think one that we we've had a lot of discussion on um, but I think it's so important um, Deanna and her team have really focused on identifying at a customer level where ener energy burden is is most pronounced defined what energy burden looks like for our, our organization they benchmarked and really, I think that one in particular provides us um, a, a, a universe of folks that we can uh, continue to have additional outreach 
enroll those customers in our programs. And as we were talking about STEP, um, you know, there, there is a, a, a perspective that, well, if you're low income, you're low usage, and that's not the case. Um, identifying these folks who have that energy burden so that we can get them connected with Casa Verde and be able to help drive that energy need out of their homes. It does a couple of things. One, helps us by reducing demand, right? And it also helps our customers, and in particular, those that have that high energy burden to, um, to eliminate that uh, energy loss in perpetuity, like the mayor said. So uh, there are a lot of things on this slide um, that the team has been working on for the last two years, but I think that's one that is really important to identify. It's us getting intentional about those in greatest need so that we can, on a personal level, target them for programs, get them enrolled, and help, um, help families who are struggling to, to, uh, to pay their energy uh, bills. Thank you. Um, if, uh, the next question is for Corey. If we can go to the slide about past due accounts. Corey, this, this data has been presented several different ways, and I know you and I have talked to length about it. The need to, to, to add, I guess, to focus, and, and, and because again, I was trying to address working with you indirectly, how, how can we communicate more effectively, not just to my colleagues here, but to the community about this? So one quick question. If, if what is the average non-collection outside of, of, of this specific focus on collecting debt? What is the, the historical percentage of not collecting? OK, past due accounts, between 10 or $20 million um, historically. So, in it, in, so historically, we, we do non-recoverables about 20 million, correct? That'd be a high, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so walk me through this slide once more. And so if I understand this correctly, so 42.7 million has, will be written off no matter what. Uh, most of these, maybe a small business went out of, out of business, uh, someone moved and we can't get a hold of them. What are other non-recoverable non activities that they would be in this bucket? Yeah, I mean, that, that's mainly it because we, there's a, a large effort we're required to do in terms of making sure we recover dollars uh, owed to us. So it takes time. Um, but by the time you get in this bucket, um, you're inactive because we can't find you. And, you know, to your point, the business or the individual is just gone. Um, and so that's that middle one. Okay. And so, again... 83.1 has been engaged to enroll in some payment plan. Now, these payment plans is not someone doesn't have to qualify for the most part, like low income. It's just as long as they're open and willing to, and they go into some kind of bucket for, for a, a plan. Is that correct? Yeah, I don't think they have to qualify, but they do have to make an initial payment when they sign up, correct? Yeah. Okay. So they are. So it's, it's again, no, there's no exist, there's not like a major barrier to, to have access to some kind of payment plan. Is no, that we fair want to say? people to get on those, and it's, it's good news for, for everyone when we get on. So, again, back to where uh, many of us on, on, on this, uh, I was going to say diocese, our concern is not just to make sure that the 83.1 is focused on, that we continue to have that dialogue and make sure that we're good, is the 49.7 million. Is, Correct. Yeah, we want to focus on that. And if that number got down to your 10 to $20 million that I mentioned earlier, then you're kind of in the historical space. Okay. So that's kind of, if you think about goals, right? We, right. You know, that's kind of where we want to get to, to kind of be in more in line with historical norms, give or take. In addition to collections, knocking on doors, what, what other type of activities are, are we focused on for the $49.7 million? Uh, I'll turn it over to Deanna. Yes. Thanks, Corey. The, the other part is really seeing what additional assistance could be out there. So we've been able to partner with our over 200 partners in the community to connect our customers with up to $80 million in, in financial assistance. So as Dr. Romero pointed out, we don't have the opportunity to forgive uh, bills, but what we can do is maximize the additional dollars that we get from a federal government or from the city, whoever has dollars, LIHEAP dollars, to be able to maximize that 
And the next best thing that we can do is really set up a customer on the budget payment plan. So by help, helping, the, helping customers have an average bill amount each month and then spreading out their past due is, uh, and alleviate as much as we can uh, on, on that burden, the better off that we are. Okay. This is more a CIO question, but as, as I, hear, I hear about what we've already done and where we're going, there's a lot of conversation about how do we use data, how do you use predictive data, specifically as we're modernizing our system, something that's become a real popular topic is how do we use artificial intelligence to, to be able to interfere sooner, to re retain those that are on a payment plan, and then how do we use that specific technology uh, to, to be able to do the engage or the at-risk connections. Can you talk a little bit more, uh, and this would be for the CIO, some potential ways uh, that we can leverage the modernization of our systems to be more proactive and take some of the things into consideration that have been brought up by our colleagues? Yes, ma'am. Thank you for the question. Um, you know, today we are already leveraging some of those technology capabilities. In fact, a few months ago, we implemented a, a proactive analytics model that helps us invest uh, the, our dollars to replace underground cables before they reach a point of failure and actually you know, end up uh, interrupting service for our customers. So we have a lot of those capabilities in-house today and wherever we can deploy those to introduce efficiencies from an operational perspective, which also yields savings, we certainly prioritize those things. As we look ahead, Evolve our digital transformation will um, really open up many more of those opportunities. One of the things that we struggle with today is how disparate a lot of our data is, and that is largely because of the complexity of our technology ecosystem. So as we execute our strategy, we'll be able to start introducing a lot of these you know, forward-thinking capabilities that will not only create a lot of the, the benefits to our customers that we talk about in terms of optionalities, optionality and programs, but will also allow us to, to do things much more efficiently as an organization by maximizing the, the data to improve our operations. Would eventually, would one of the features uh, make it possible for individuals to uh, tier rates to, to be, or just usage, their usage mix, is, is it in the future where an end user would be empowered to say, today I want to use more solar versus, you know, electricity and battery storage? Is that where we're going, where users will be more empowered potentially to, to be able to have this type of, again, power at their hands? So the, our goal is absolutely to, to provide that information to our customers, right? So um, as recently as the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about in, in the future when we want to deploy some of the new rate structures that, uh, that you just described, how do we make sure that we're giving that information in real time to our customers? And that potentially could include the mix of, of generation that is fueling their particular home. Another key element of that is making sure that when they do add different options for generation, such as battery or rooftop solar, that we can get notifications whenever they're making those decisions and proactively reach out to them about different products and services that we may be able to enroll them in. And, and what are we going to take into consideration for those who may not, you know, we, we talk about the digital divide, we, we talk about digital literacy, what, what potentially, and what are we going to consider for those individuals as, as we modernize our system? Are there some thoughts already about how we plan to make sure there's a right mix of introducing technology, but at the same time being very aware that not everybody has consistent access or may not have access, to, especially our seniors? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that is very much a part of our digital strategy is empowering our entire workforce with the technology solutions that we're putting in place. So when they're in front of our customers interacting with them and Deanna uh, and her organization, our crew teams do an amazing job of, of getting out in the community, um, but also our walk-in centers, making sure that we're, we're making those experiences avail available for our customers and meeting them where they are, whether that is, you know, one of our crew team members, um, you know, knocking on one of our customers' doors and being able to pull out a mobile device that, that allow us to provide access to that information, or when customers come into our walk-in walk centers, making sure that we're able to get them to those same outcomes, even if they may not have access to the technology in their home. For, for answering those questions, I have one last question. I'm not sure who can answer this. So we see an increase of grant funding opportunities uh, as a way for new revenue streams. Uh, who, who can speak to that? Uh, 
If you can shed some light of what's driving the access to, to grant funding. Um, thank you for the question. <clears throat> There has been over um, the past uh, couple of years significant federal funding through the BIL as well as um, uh, funding specific to energy transition. And so we are actively monitoring and looking for opportunities, um, grant opportunities predominantly at the, the federal level right now that map um, those opportunities to the projects and programs we're trying to deliver for our customers. So there are projects that we already have in our capital plan that we can um, seek funds and get either matching or direct pay. And so um, we currently have three, uh, three grants in flight and we're, um, we're building additional grant opportunities as we speak. We just formed a, a team around that. Um, I, I know during the, the city council um, session, there was a, a point brought up by Councilwoman uh, District 7. Mm -hmm. And so she talked about the eligibility, uh, if, we if we could increase the eligibility, there was two programs. Do, do you recall that conversation? I, I, I could go back and look at my notes. I think we were talking about REAP and ADP, if, if, okay. if that is yeah. And so she, she suggested if there was consideration to change the per, to, to, change, to move it up for people to be more, to become eligible, that ours was different compared to the other one. Do you remember the percentage? I do, um, and this is, this is subject to checking from others, but I think we were talking about REAP and ADP, but I think REAP, we have, we're at 125% of the federal poverty line. And there was a discussion about, is there an opportunity to look at that threshold and see if we might be able to uh, adjust it? Yep. Can you add, I was really interested on in that feedback and I thought it was really good. And so I just wanted to see what our thoughts were on that. Yep. Madam, Madam Chair, uh, I, there's a conversation about, you know, how we might expand, um, you know, the uh, affordability, the affordability program uh, and REAP for that matter, in, in terms of income eligibility which I think is a, a worthwhile exercise for us to look at. Um, so, you know, that's probably something we'll have a conversation with the board about, you know, going forward uh, that will allow us to maybe do some targeted outreach for seniors in particular. That's where the council has really been focused on. But, uh, you know, obviously that's a conversation that we need to have with the board as we move forward with. Thank you. I, I found that conversation very meaningful when we were there in the audience. And so I'm just going to conclude. I, I think, again, all my colleagues, including our mayor, have, have provided some really excellent feedback of why they're supporting it. I'm very mindful that we all have a very specific point of view and that everybody here has worked really, really hard to arrive at where they're at. I'm really proud of everyone here. And it's not proud because, because of the actions that potentially will take place. What I'm most proud of is the dialogue. This is one of the most engaged Board of Trustees, and I'm honored to, to serve with everybody who's here. And it's been a lot of work. I, I will tell you that my experience as a freshman, as far as how we work with staff, is day and night. It is day and night that we get to ask tough questions, that we get to challenge them, and they've been responsive. Yes, like Dr. Romero says, sometimes we get presentations and sometimes we're like, hmm. <laughs> but that's our responsibility to ask those questions. And so thank you for being so open to, to doing things differently. And then the only other thing I have to add is, you know, um, I do believe that we need more feedback from, from our end users. And I know it's sometimes, as mentioned, tough for someone to take time off to, to be here. Um, but I also believe that my, my, my advocate is my, the mayor that I vote for. The, the advocates that serve on city council. I look to my council for guidance, and then I look to my board for, for guidance. And then we look through the democratic process for that consumer feedback, whether it's, again, knocking on doors, hosting community outreach, hosting evening public input sessions. And so, you know, I personally will continue to find ways that we can get more engagement of, of our end users or and so, again, just thank you to everyone. And, and this concludes, I believe. And then, oh, Mr. Steen has some additional. No, no, I think Mr. Steen has additional comments. Go, go ahead, sir. I think you know where this, obviously, where this board is headed. So then your next step is the city council. And I know that it, when you were over at city council that Mark, Councilman Mark White asked you about, about Spruce One. And, and that was the answer you gave about the $200 million. Yes, sir. But I wanted to ask you about something at our 
at our February 28, 2022 board meeting, and Dr. Romero, it was your first meeting as a trustee, um, this board approved your request to spend $50 million to build a three-acre pond to hold spruce sludge waste. You, rec you, you recall that? Be yeah, because we can't keep running it until up through 2028 without getting that work done. So you don't do that pond, then we'd have to shut spruce down because we couldn't get it permitted. And it, it had to be completed by September 2023, and it's completed? It's, it uh, Benny, come up, come up here and, and give an update. I know we had some delays uh, on that work, but I think we're done with it. I just want to pause real quick and confirm. Um, you believe that this discussion is necessary to, to make your vote on the rate case? It's fine, Mr. Well, Stevens. Well, I'm, I'm uh, it, just answer the question. Yeah, Mark, it's, it's fine. Mr. Mark White. Hold on. Uh, hold on. This is a governance requirement. I simply asked the trustee if he wanted to continue his discussion for the purpose of voting on the rate case. That is my obligation. It's not discretionary. It's to ensure compliance with the Open Meeting Act. Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And with it. Yep. Rudy, you, you are correct. The project is complete and it's in service. There. And, and, and so, uh, so we had that, we had that um, requirement where the EPA was saying you have to do it by, by um, what did I say, September 2023. But these, these other things, uh, this uh, ELG project, um, the, the SCR system, you know, the other things, why are, why are we given so much leeway in terms of having to complete those? Why aren't we given? Why are we? Well, we're we're not. We in order to run on past. In other words, they, the they, compliance date, we would have to make that investment. And what is the compliance date? On that? Benny, I think it's twenty twenty eight. I think this is this might be helpful to you to get it to hear because you know perhaps Councilman White seems to be interested in it. I, Councilman White and I have had this conversation, sir. So, uh, you know, I'm not. I'll do, I can deal with Councilman White at Council, but we've had this conversation. Yes, sir, you are correct. We have to complete the SCR installation we're anticipating by 2028, uh, whether that unit was converted to gas or remained on coal. The ELG work would have to be completed again by 2028. It'd be 27. There, there's been some movement on that rule if we were going to continue on coal operation. And are are we getting um, are we getting um, we have to ask for that delay or is it how does that, is that being granted to us that we don't have to do it until so those in twenty twenty five we're required to give notice if it is our intent to shut down our units on coal or continue operation. Thank you. I won't belabor it. Yes, sir. Any any additional comments by any uh, trustee or mayor or or CEO? Anybody? All righty. Uh, again, thank you for, for the comments, the discussion. And so here we go. Do I have a motion to approve the 4.25? We already have a motion in the second, ma'am, so we're ready. There is a second. Yeah, we already have it. We already have one. All right. Roll call. Uh, Trustee Dr. Mackey? Yes. Trustee Steen? Yes. Mayor? Yes. Vice Chair? Yes. Chair? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, so we had the regulatory asset approved, and just to make sure we're clear, because there was a lot of conversation, and then we've had the approval of the 4.25 base increase. Yes, okay. ma'am. All right, item number, let's see where I'm at, I'm losing my space Six. here. Six, resolution on base increase and multi-year rate plan, and we already did that vote. No. No, we did it, regulatory. Move to approve, move to approve the resolution of the base rate increase in multi-rate plan and regulatory asset. This is the motion that's, to approve the resolution. That's what we just did, I think. This is to approve the resolution. Just the resolution. Is there a second to approve the resolution? Let's make sure just for procedural reasons that we're clear because I want to make sure there's, everybody's clear. This is a motion to approve the resolution that was included in your board packet and posted online. There's no changes to the resolution. I have a motion from Dr. Mackey. Is there a second? Is it open for discussion? No clarity, no clarification. Go ahead, Mr. Steve. <clears throat> uh, 
this was, <clears throat> sorry, the resolution was changed on Friday. Um, and I, um, I'm trying to understand, I read through it and, I, and, it, and it talked about a multi-year plan, but why was it necessary to, to change uh, the, the, the agenda, to repost the agenda on Friday? You want to clarify that? You want to answer that? Uh, yes. Um, so as is clear um, in the changes to the agenda, there was a change to the naming of um, agenda item five and agenda item six to be more clear. There were changes to the language of the resolution. Um, I would say no material changes, but additional background was included in the resolution for clarity and transparency. Transparency. Oh, that's, that's right, Mr. Steen. What happened was when I, would, I kept looking at the agenda, originally it said base, base increase rate and then multi-year rate plan. And so I felt it was redundant. So we just remove rate from base increase. And then it's, it is what it is today, which is rate increase and multi-year rate plan. But none of the key information was, was changed. You know, I compared them, and, and of course, none of the resolutions were changed. And it was just adding um, the language. Like five recital paragraphs, you know, the ones that begin with whereas. And so I'm just wondering, it seems like that was a lot of trouble that was gone to on well, Friday. Well, but I, I think part of it is, again, just making sure that everything is, I mean, clear and concise. That's it. We're just really working hard to make sure that all the information is accurate. It, accurate. it means everybody's, you know, feedback that we get often. Any other no, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Steen. So we're back to roll call. Trustee Dr. Mackey? Yes. Trustee Steen? Yes. Mayor? Yes. Vice Chair? Yes. Chair? Yes. Resolution is approved. Okay, item number seven, which is review action items. Yes, ma'am. Of the pending action items, there is one that remains open. And that is the request from Trustee Steen to memorialize the basis of his vote on agenda item eight at the October 31st, 2023 board meeting. That's included in the board minutes that are expected to be approved at the December 18th regular board meeting. All of the remaining action items are closed. And with respect to today, I had three action items that I recorded. I have a request from Trustee Steen on agenda item number five to record the basis of his votes um, in the minutes. Um, that will be um, included in the minutes um, that I expect to be approved at a future uh, regular board meeting. The second action item I have is on agenda item five. Uh, the vice chair requested an easier way to get to the read, to read your bill section from the homepage, less than two clicks. The team has already started working on that, so I expect to have that completed shortly. And item number three was also on agenda item five. Um, and the vice chair uh, requested that there is um, consideration or evaluation of REAP and ADP consolidation for efficiency purposes. So we'll begin consideration of that. And I think just to build upon that, minus the consideration of the qualifications to see how we can align that. Yes, ma'am, I added a fourth action item uh, from the chair, and that is consideration of qualification uh, requirements for ADP and for REAP. Yes. Okay, so now we're going to convene to executive session. Item number eight, attorney client matters, 551071, and competitive matters, 551086. If you can please take us to executive session. Yes, ma'am. At this time, this board is going to recess into executive session, discuss matters that have been duly posted under several provisions of Chapter 551 of the Texas Government Code, including those you just reiterated. At the conclusion of executive session, the board will reconvene in open session, continue the meeting. It is 519 as we go to executive session.
Ms. Ramirez, if you can bring us back from, but Ms. Ramirez, if you could please bring us back from executive session. It is 5.30 and the board has concluded executive session. I can confirm that there were no votes taken and no matters were discussed that were not part of the posted agenda. We do have a quorum and all members are present. Thank you. Item number nine, which is a uh, to conclude the meeting. Is there a motion? Okay, so I, there was a tie by the mayor. I'm gonna give it to the mayor. And then there was a second by Dr. Mackey. This concludes her meeting. Thank you, everyone. Oh, all in favor? Aye.